spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, On the fifteenth day of this seventh month, and for seven days, is the feast of booths to the Lord. On the first day shall be a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. For seven days you shall present food offerings to the Lord. On the eighth day you shall hold a holy convocation and present a food offering to the Lord. It is a solemn assembly. You shall not do any ordinary work. These are the appointed feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim as times of holy convocation, for presenting to the Lord food offerings, burnt offerings, and grain offerings, sacrifices and drink offerings, each on its proper day, besides the Lord's Sabbaths, and besides your gifts, and besides all your vow offerings, and besides all your free will offerings, which you give to the Lord. On the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the produce of the land, you shall celebrate the feast of the Lord seven days. On the first day shall be a solemn rest, and on the eighth day shall be a solemn rest. And you shall take on the first day the fruit of splendid trees, branches of palm trees, and boughs of leafy trees, and willows of the brook. And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. You shall celebrate it as a feast of the Lord for seven days in the year. It is a statute forever throughout your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall dwell in booths for seven days. All native Israelites shall dwell in booths, that your generations may know that I made the people of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Good morning, church. Thank you, uh, Sister Susan, for leading us into a time of worship. Yeah? Um, there is some technical problem. The problem is those who are hearing now won't be able to hear me because there are certain phones having problem, uh, what you call receiving the YouTube uh, link, uh, and uh, because we're using a new system. So if you're with iPhones, if you're using your TV or your laptop, should be okay. But if you're using certain brands, like Samsung, Huawei, maybe uh, Oppo and so on, you're going to have problem uh, receiving the service this morning because of the total overhaul of a new system that we are using currently. Yeah? So if you still cannot get uh, what you call the service this morning, no worries, it's recorded. By 2 o'clock today, it should be online again. Yeah? So we apologize for that. And we do hear all the comments that has been given earlier on. All right. Good morning, church, to everybody here. Yeah? Good to see you all and good to, good to see those who are at home. I can, uh, you cannot see, I cannot see you, but you can see me. All right? Let's look to the Lord, a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for this wonderful morning. Just thank you that, Lord, you are with us all the time. You are with us, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, that as we come to hear your word, you will speak to us, build up our faith, strengthen our inner man, and enable us to comprehend, Lord, your love even better. In Jesus' most wonderful name, Lord. Amen. This morning, I want to continue on with my sharing on The God Who Journeys, Part 9. The title of my sharing is Feast of the Pilgrims. Feast of the Pilgrims, yeah? So, um, who wants to talk about feast at this juncture or moment in our lives, especially as we're going through the uncertainty of the pandemic? But let's look at the Word of God this morning. God's word is never chained, bound by circumstances, situations, or even whatever that we think we should anticipate. God's word is not chained to all those things here. Yeah? It's above and lifted up far above all those things that we think should impact, affect, or even affect God's word. Amen? Now, when God... You see, the Bible is very interesting because when it talks about a feast... It is not abstract. Abstract means, for example, if I ask you, why do you celebrate Mother's Day on 10th of May? Why do you celebrate Father's Day on the third Sunday of June? Probably there is a story behind it, right? But then we don't know. It, it is very abstract. On a chronological or calendar, we see those times in the year as celebrating Mother's Day, Father's Day, and every other day. All right? Of course, there will be some story linked to it. But then to us, it's rather abstract. But come the month of May, June, May or June, you will have this thing, yeah? All right? 
sometimes uh, uh, what do you call the people who organize these events are also very very weary about it because in terms of getting response you don't get the response or the kind of response that you expect for example hotels get very good turnout for mother's day but very poor turnout or respond to father's day point to ponder <laughs> All fathers point to wonder, but do not know what is it in our culture or what. Year by year, every year, they have this problem. But the, the issue now is this. We celebrate a lot of things in life in abstract form. That means we pick and choose a date and it is somehow celebrated on that day, but not in God's Word. In God's Word, every feast, every celebration is part and parcel of three things. One is God's working. It has to be connected to something that God has done, accomplished, is accomplishing or is going to accomplish. Second, man's activities. That means the way we respond, the way we address, and the way we play our part in that workings of God. And then thirdly, the time and seasons. First, you have the chronological calendar or the normal calendar that we have of 12 months. Different culture, different civilization have different calendars and different religion also have different calendars. So they build in within it a kind of an almanac eh, or activities, programs that are connected to a calendar. And then you have seasons. All right, here in Malaysia, we don't see seasons. No? We see hot, hotter, rain, rainier. All right. <laughs> and flood, uh, now you got flood. You know, for, for, for two years, the haze has been in a lockdown situation. Did you notice? For two years, we didn't have any haze. That was already part of our season now. But thank God, they are also under lockdown. Otherwise, we will be in a horror state. Eh? All right, so what happened is in the, uh, what do you call, uh, Bible or the Old Testament, they follow the, because they are agrarian society or agriculture-based society, whatever they celebrate is connected to their seasons. So you have the spring, the summer, the fall, or the autumn, and the winter. All right? And in the Bible, this is connected. Agriculture or agrarian societies, they do everything according to the agriculture cycle. Like in some of the countries that we work, we almost know that what is the celebration that is ongoing based on the month. For example, now it's October, right? October, November is autumn in the northern hemisphere. All right? It's harvest. It's the end of the, what do you call the massive harvest, huh? All right, and this harvest, they have, and we know what celebration will follow. You only need to live in this culture for about two years, you will have a hang of it. That everything they do is tied into their seasons. And you know, oh, now it's the time they're going to have this celebration, that celebration. All right, so it's tied in. We are not agriculture society. Once upon a time, we were. Huh? All right? But the strange part is, we still follow our ancestors' calendar be it the Indian, the Chinese, right? For example, you had your mid-autumn festival. Do we have autumn in Malaysia? We don't. But it's passed on by culture, you see? And then comes your Kwe Chang thing, it's the summer, is it? Usually it's in the summer, right? Summer, and, and you have, comes the, it's winter, you have your color, what do you call that? I don't know what. Ah, you have that. So are the Indians, the Indians are the same. Even though we have, our ancestors have left India, everything that we do here is still connected to the calendar. Did you know that? Whether we realize it or not. But this morning, I want to encourage and challenge you to look beyond our culture and look at God's Word. I'm not telling you to go and celebrate all these things. But the spirit behind this celebration that applies to us. All right? So remember, when God says the feast in the Bible, it is all these three things together. And all these three things make up the feast in the Bible. Now, what are the feasts found in the Bible? As was read just now from Leviticus 23, verses 33 to 43, but the whole chapter talks about all the seven feasts. There are actually seven feasts. It starts with Passover, somewhere in spring of late March or early May, early April. Yeah? And then it goes on to the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the 
feast of first fruits, you have three there. Then you come to Pentecost, four. Pentecost is somewhere during summertime. Again, there is a harvest behind it, yeah? Likewise with Passover. Then you go over somewhere into the autumn, that is September, early to mid September, early September to mid October. You have the Feast of Trumpets, of which comes along the New Year. The Jewish people celebrate two New Years. One is the religious New Year in uh, during Passover, and the other one is what you call the sorry. Uh, one is during Passover, and then the other one is during the Feast of Trumpets, known as Rosh Hashanah. All right. Then they have the Feast of it's not a feast, but it's called the Day of Atonement. That makes six. Then finally, you have the Feast of Tabernacles. Got it, huh? But there are three feasts. All children of Israel, wherever they are on planet Earth, especially the male, have to make a pilgrimage trip to Jerusalem. That is Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. And we know the Feast of Passover relates with God the Son. The Feast of Pentecost relates with God the Holy Spirit. And the Feast of Tabernacle relates to God the Father. God the Father. So the two feasts has already been completed. We are celebrating in memory or in remembrance. Because the Son has come, the Holy Spirit has come and is still around. Next will be all of us with the Father. Everyone, the Son and the Spirit working together to bring us to the Father. So the underlying theme across all these feasts is pilgrimage. And in fact, God used this word. You will see this in Levit Leviticus chapter 23. Yeah? I want holy convocation. Convocation, we only use it for graduation, isn't it? But in the Bible, convocation means the gathering of God's people for the reason of being with Yahweh. Full stop. A Sabbath is known as a time of holy convocation. So God said there are three holy convocations that I want you to be in Jerusalem and I want to meet with my people. That is the Feast of Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. All right? And I understand they just celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles in Israel somewhere late September, early October. All right? And they have seven days in this feast. And this feast is still being celebrated until today. Because even though all these three feasts are connected to the temple, only the other two, first two, is very heavily relying on the function of the temple. The third one you can celebrate at home, which they do until today, which we'll look into, into it later. And it's so interesting, yeah? That in the New Testament, all these are already fulfilled. Okay, so what is the Feast of Tabernacles? It's called... The Feast of Ingathering. I'm wondering why the G came down. Sorry. The, the, the Feast of Ingathering. Yeah? All right. And Feast of Ingathering is because that is the last harvest. Take note of this. Huh? It's the final harvest. And also it's the end of the year, the beginning of a new year. The beginning of a new year. If now you go to the Northern Hemisphere's Asian countries, like uh, Myanmar, Thailand, Laos, Vietnam, there's celebration going on until mid of November, until 11 or 15th of November. Because they just completed their harvest, they're celebrating, they got a lot of money, and then they will just have one event after another, which will climax somewhere the full moon of November. See? To all these years, I still remember what they do. Because it is tied in into all that they do. All right, and of course they have stories behind it. So the Feast of Tabernacles is also called the Feast of Booth. Why? Because they will set up the shelters at the front of their house or within the compound of their houses, which they do until today, church. If you were there during the Feast of Tabernacles in Israel, people still, or wherever they are on planet Earth, they still do this. They build this, uh, what you call, booth for seven days because in the portion of Scripture that was read just now, it is said very clearly, God said, I want you to build a hut or a booth or a shelter in front of your house or within your, the vicinity of your houses for seven days. And there is a reason why he commanded them to do so. And they've been doing it for thousands of years, wherever they are or they have been scattered. 
It is also called the feast of the nations. Why? Because Zechariah and even Zephaniah also said this, that that day will come and the nations will celebrate the feast of tabernacles in the presence of God. And of course, Bible scholars are always confounded by this, especially Jewish rabbis, because they never see the Gentiles or the nations be included in the celebration. They will never... I mean, it's scandalizing. All right? It's purely reserved for them only. But the prophet Zechariah and Zephaniah even mentioned this, yeah? that the nations will celebrate. You and I know what it stands for. It's also called the, the Feast of Joy or the Season of Joy. Why? After harvest, everything is plentiful. You are so thankful. People are gathering together, celebrating. So it's a time of joy. That's why the psalmist says, Blessed are those who know the joyful sound of the feast. And that's what it means. This is found in the Hallel Psalms, or psalm that starts from Psalms 118. And it goes like that, yeah? that we are celebrating with joy. But in the New Testament, is the Feast of Tabernacle mentioned? Yes, it is. It is called the Feast. Bible scholar says, in the, Bible, in the New Testament, it is always called the Feast. But before we go to the New Testament, Let's look at some key points. First, it's the final harvest. And it's the final feast. Keep that at the back of your mind. Eh? It's the final harvest and the final feast. And therefore, it is a season of joy. Why? The Lord told them, seven days you shall do it. So it's a season of joy. And in all of this, He will ask the people of Israel to remember, and you and I too, Remember the exodus. Remember when God set you free. Remember when the Messiah came and died on the cross. The basis or foundation of all our celebration is Christ, Him crucified, buried, rose again on the third day, 40th day ascended to heaven, on the 50th day sent the Holy Spirit and is coming back again. That is the foundation. And in all this celebration, the foundation is always that. The Exodus. God will always remind them, do not forget. Generation after generation, do not forget the Exodus. And now you know why on the night of his agony, when Moses and Elijah appeared to him on Mount Transfiguration, Luke said in Luke chapter 9, they were discussing about his Exodus. They were discussing about the Lord's Exodus. And in this Feast of Tabernacles, there are three aspects that we will look into later on. It's the shelter, the water, and the light. And these three things are closely connected with the celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles. And the Feast of Tabernacles is the Feast of the Pilgrims. Why? Because that's when all the pilgrims from all over the world will come to Jerusalem to remember the great Yahweh God and all that He has done. And mind you, do you know that the Lord Jesus fulfills all this in the New Testament? Because in Deuteronomy 16.16, 16, it is said that all these feasts must be adhered to by the male, what you call a member of the, of the family. And you notice, if you read your gospel properly, he goes up to Jerusalem in all these feasts. And he celebrates them. Why? Because that is the backbone. The backbone of the New Testament is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed, explained, fulfilled. All right? So, just take note of this. In the Gospel of John, when John was writing the Gospel, the Bible scholars said this. He wrote the whole Gospel with the feast at the back of his mind. In fact, the timeline that John used was the feast. And all the wordings that he used leads you back to the feast. So in the Gospel of John, three times Passovers were mentioned. Three times tabernacles, the Feast of Tabernacles were mentioned. Most of it as the feast, except in chapter 7 it is said clearly. And one time as the Feast of Dedication, it is called Hanukkah. It's not commanded, but it's a cultural celebration because of the 
victory of the Maccabean revolt in the 400 gap between the Old and the New Testament. And this is somewhere during Christmas time. And it is said that the Lord was in the Solomon porch during the Feast of Dedication. Yeah? So John used the feast as a guideline. All right? So the Feast of Tabernacles, the one that we are looking into today, is from chapter 7, verse 1 of the Gospel of John until chapter 10 to verse 21. That is the context of the Feast of Tabernacles happening in Jerusalem. So all the incidents that you see happening there, the pouring out of the water, the inviting of the people to come and drink of the living water, the healing of the blind man, the story of the Good Shepherd, all in the context of the Feast of Tabernacles, ongoing now in Jerusalem. So that is the context of, that John is giving us. And now, this is just postulating. Because Bible scholars say, John, when he keeps feasts at the back of his mind, his month, he chose the right word, and the Holy Spirit made sure, made sure that that word is used. In John chapter 1, which is the Christmas story of the Gospel of John, he said the eternal word became flesh. I'm using the amplified version, the contemporary one. Eh? Human or incarnate. Eh? And tabernacled or fixed his tent of flesh and lived a while among us. In the Greek, it is the word skinu or skinu. Skune, yeah? Skune means pitch a tent. Put up a tabernacle, put up a booth or a shelter. So it is said that the word took a tabernacle or pitched a tent or built a tabernacle among us and dwelt with us. That choice of the word, the Bible scholars are saying, could it be that he's suggesting to us that the Lord was born during this time? Because of the choice of his word, we do not know. That is only a postulation. All right? Don't go around saying, Mark said, the Lord was born during the Feast of Tabernacle. All right? It's not. It's just a postulation. But the words that he used conveys to us the truth that God came and built a tent among us, tabernacled among us. In chapter 7, something happened. It was the Feast of Tabernacles proper in the second or third year. This is the third year, going into the sorry, second, late of second year probably, of his public ministry. And what happened was, there was a lot of bruaha. Everybody was wondering, are you going to go up to the feast? Even his family members, his own half-brothers and sisters, or brothers in this case, made fun of him. He said, aren't you going to go to Jerusalem? After all, you're famous, what? Why are you hiding here in Galilee? Go to Jerusalem, now, show yourself. Then everybody will know you're the Messiah. His own half-brothers uh, saying that to him. He said, you all go first, my time is not up yet. So he went up to Jerusalem, and it is said, at the height of the feast, he cried out in John chapter 7, verse 37, whoever is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. What he was doing was this. There is a pool in Jerusalem called the Pool of Siloam, which is the picture on the background. Usually it's dry. Don't know what happened there. The latest photo says the water has gone up because of the rain that is happening now in that region. And so this is the Pool of Siloam proper. What the priest will do is, every day during the seven days of the Feast of Tabernacle celebration, they will go down with a golden pitcher to the Pool of Siloam, take water and have a big procession back to the temple and they will pour it at the, uh, what do you call, altar, on the altar, altar of burnt offering. Yeah? They will pour it there and there will be a big celebration. It was on the final day of this libation or the pouring of the water from the golden pitcher by the priest that the Lord Jesus stood and said, He who is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He's telling all the pilgrims who were there. And everybody was shocked. Oh, he's here. And he said, the fulfillment, John adds to it, the fulfillment is the Holy Spirit, whom because he's not glorified yet, he's not been given. He's saying he's the baptizer and the giver of the Holy Spirit, which is the 
heart and interpretation of the meaning of the whole libation or the priest taking the water from the gold, with the golden pitcher from the pool of Siloam, which means, by the way, scent. Siloam simply means scent. And pouring on the altar. It is the symbol of the Son fulfilling the sacrifice on the cross and the Holy Spirit is being poured forth onto the pilgrims. And he stood on that day and said that. And it is also said that during the seven day of celebration, the Jews will lit up this huge, gigantic uh, menorah or the candelabras, uh, or what do you call that? That, that uh, lampstand. Lampstand. Some estimate by Bible scholars is this. It goes up right up to 75 feet. And because it's dark, they don't have electricity those days. And Jerusalem is on the, mount, on the hill, eh? on the mount, mount, mount of Zion. When they lit up this thing, the whole city looks brightened up because of this light. Eh? All right, and they will dance around the, the lampstand, celebrate God. Eh? And it was during this period of time that in John chapter 8, verse 12, and after or before or during the healing of the blind man who was born blind, that the Lord said this, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. It was during that time he said it. Everybody understood what he meant. When he healed the blind man, he said this, darkness, you know, I have an answer for darkness. It's me. I am the light of the world. While I'm around, it's day. Then the night is coming. Then you and I have to be the light through the Holy Spirit. And he, you should read chapter 8 and chapter 9 of the book of the Gospel of John, understanding this Feast of Tabernacle, you'll be surprised how precise he is in the fulfillment of all those things that are happening during the celebration of the feast. And then he ends it so beautifully up to chapter 10, verse 21. He said this, I am the good shepherd. Because in the Jewish culture or in the biblical culture, shelter and booth is equivalent to provision, protection and presence. These three things it's the meaning of the whole booth that is being built in front of their house, every feast of tabernacles. And he's saying, I am the good shepherd. And he went on further. He said, I am the door. I am the way. And he said, I am the door to the sheephole. I am the one, he said. And he ends that celebration on that high note that I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd gives his life for his sheep. So there are three things that happened that night, that day, that during that Feast of Tabernacle from John chapter 7, verse 1 until chapter 10, verse 21. The booth, remember, protection, provision, and presence, symbolizing the Good Shepherd, the pillar of fire to lead and guide us and sustain us, the lampstand. And he said, I am the light of the world. The water the life-giving Holy Spirit roll and function in our life as we continue on in our journey as pilgrims. Now, all these three things, they are still being fulfilled. They are still being fulfilled in our journey. Why attend church? Because the Lord was telling them, when the children of Israel left Egypt, they had to dwell in tent. Until they reached the promised land, it's always in a tent. And in a tent is where the Lord met them. He was also living in a tent, right in the middle of them, called the Tabernacle of Moses. So he, he enjoyed living with his people who was doing or who was accomplishing their pilgrimage into the Promised Land. And he said, that's what it shall be. Abram said it very well in Hebrews chapter 11. He is not looking for a city built by man, but a city whose architect and builder is God himself, the city of the living God. In the meantime, we all live in tent while we complete our journey. All right? Now, church, Christians, we were known as Christians in the Bible 
only in Acts, the book of Acts, uh, chapter 11. And that is also in a city far, far away from Israel called Antioch. That was the place they were called Christians. All right? Or mini Christ or representative of Christ. Some people say it could be even a mockery, what you call a, a name given. I mean, it's more like a mocking tone. Eh? Because it was given by the people around them. We were called Christians. The other name that were given to Christians in the book of Acts were Nazarenes. The people who follow Jesus of Nazareth. There's another name given in the Bible for all of us. It's called the people of the way. The people of the way. Acts chapter 9 verse 2 and 22 verse 4 says this. Saul of Tarsus persecuted those of the way. Referring to the believers. And then they spoke evil of the way in Acts chapter 19. Then in Ephesus there was a riot because of the people or the adherents of the temple of Diana was so upset with Paul, they said the riot is because of these people of the way. And then Paul, when he stood testifying, he said, I worship God according to the way. And then when he stood before Felix, the governor, who was actually very interested to hear about what Paul has to say, and purposely, deliberately kept Paul for two years there, though there was another part of Felix that was revealed in the scripture, Purposely, he kept Paul for two years because he wanted to know more about the way. What is people of the way and the way? But the Bible says Felix actually kept him there two years because he was hoping for Paul to hulo him. Hulo him so that, yes, it's found in the Bible, go and read it. He was hoping for Paul to hulo him and then release him. They never change over the years. <laughs> All right. So the hulo culture is also mentioned in the Bible. And Felix, the governor, was the same. And Paul explained to him more accurately about the way. What is this way? What is this way thing? You know, when the Lord said, we, the people of God, we are two ways. Two way, one is the broad way, the other one is a narrow way. We are people of the narrow way. Because the, broad is, the broader is the way leading to destruction. Narrow is the way leading to life. Alright? And then, in John 14, 6, the Lord said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now, the Greek word for the way is hodos. Alright? It means a road. Then, the Greek interchangeably uses the word hodeo. It, it simply means one who travels on the road or one who is journeying on the road. It's not just the road, it's the journey. So what the Lord is saying in this portion of scripture when he said, I am the way, he's not only saying, I am the way, the road leading to the Father. He's saying, I am the journey. And because I am the journey, you and I are with him in that journey and on that road. He is going to be with us every step of the way. And if we read the Gospel of John correctly, He's saying, I will build my tent with you as you journey along until you reach to the Father. And the truth of the journey, in a journey, in our aspiration to find truth, and everyone is in the mode to find the truth, he said, the truth is none other. I am the truth. He personified the journey, he personified the truth, and then he said this, I am the life. And because we are walking or journeying together with Him, church, He is our journey. He is our road. He is our life. He is our truth. There is no other place that we need to look upon except on the Lord Himself. And let me tell of a story to connect this. eh? The people in Gateway, The people in Gateway, have you ever wondered, wondered, yeah? Pastor Moses probably had an angel visit him to give him that name to us on that day. I still remember it was done at the, what you call, Emperor Hotel, when he announced it. And he explained to us, because it's of the Gateway, what you call, Porta de Santiago, is it? That was the Gateway. All right. When I was preparing this message, I was thinking about us. Gate is the door. Way and people of the journey. 
Did we, every one of us, we are the people of the door that the Lord... That's why Apostle Paul always prays, no? the door of opportunities will be open for the gospel. And every now and then, he talks about this door. What door is this? Door for people to find the Lord. Door for people to experience Him who is the way, the truth, and the life. Automatically, we follow in the footstep of the Master. We become the door. And we become the way. We become the journey. And we bring in people into this pilgrimage together with the Lord. That's why we are called Gateway. <laughs> Amen? Amen? We are called Gateway. We are not people who are getting away. We are people who are a gateway. A gateway for God. A gateway for the Lord to work through everybody's life, both believers and unbelievers. And let me say this, yeah? Paul, after all the journey that he has gone with the Lord, he used the word tabernacle again at a very important aspect or turning point of his life. It is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, 12, verse 9. He said, I had this thorn of the flesh. It's a messenger of Satan. We do not know what it is. It could be demonic. It could be sickness. It could be a weakness. We do not know what it is. But it's one thing we know. That thorn in the flesh caused him to have strengthlessness. The word weakness... Infirmities are all the same in the Greek. It means without strength. Strengthlessness. And Paul is saying, you know, when I was struggling with this thorn of the flesh, and I begged the Lord three times, and all He said to me was this, My grace is enough for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Oh, my power is made perfect in strengthlessness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my strengthlessness, Apostle Paul said, so that the power of Christ, now wait for this, the power of Christ may pitch a tent upon me. That is the original word, skone. Right? It means to pitch a tent. Literally coming, overshadowing and built a tent around me. The closest picture you can get of this is in Luke chapter 9. When Peter, James and John were on Mount Transfiguration and Peter saw Elijah, Moses and the Lord was there. He said, Lord, shall I build three tabernacles, three tents? Then the Bible said the cloud came. This is the cloud of glory. The Father's representation. Eh? The cloud came and hovered, covered all of them, overshadowed them. It's the same thought here. It came and overshadowed them, and the voice said, No, 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 I'm paraphrasing. No, 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 not three tens, just one. This is my beloved son, listen to him. And then they were gone. When angel Gabriel came and Mary said, How is it I know that, you know, how I'm, I'm a virgin? How am I going to bear the son? Oh, the power of the Holy Spirit will come and overshadow you, same thought. It will come and overshadow you. Build a tent, church. And the Apostle Paul is saying here that the strength and power of Christ the Messiah may pitch a tent upon me in my strengthlessness. That is the password of all pilgrims. Amen? No matter where we are, we feel strengthless. We feel... That's why the next verse, Paul said this. Therefore, I glory in my necessities, I glory in my distress, I glory in all my weaknesses. Anything that causes me to go strengthless. Because when I am weak, I am strong. What is that? Because when I am weak, Christ will come and pitch His tent with me. I am strong. Psalms 34, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear Him. That angel of the Lord is referring to the Lord Himself. He comes and build His camp with us. So, pilgrims and fellow pilgrims, both here in the church and at home, aren't you happy that we celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles as the Feast of Tabernacles is because Christ builds His tent with us. 
That's why Paul said, and even Peter said, "Soon I'm going to discard this tent." Yes, church. There will come a day we will discard this tent and going back to the Father. Paul said it very clearly. I'm going to discard this tent. Peter said, "Before I discard this tent or tabernacle, I am going to give you a reminder." And he recounted again what happened on Mount Transfiguration. Church, my encouragement to you this morning is this: You feel strengthless. You feel distressed. You feel that a necessity is laid on you. All of us are in this together. But let us be rest assured that the feast of tabernacles already started. Why? The day He came to dwell with us, He started. He is the feast. And that's why the Apostle John is communicating to the Gospel of John. And let me encourage you: If you are going through a time in your life, you feel strengthless, you feel like you are going zero. That is the time you are going to get strengthened. Why? Because the power of Christ may rest upon me, as the cloud overshadowed, as the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary. Is the same thing with the people of God until we meet Him face to face. Amen. And we are going to sing a song together, church. But before that, yes, please. Uh, what do you call? Ben can start playing. Yeah. Let's look at the application. Let's look at the application. Yeah. Okay. What is the application? Now, the, because sometimes we can hear to messages, and we forget that there are applications behind it. So the first application is this: remember the truth behind the feast. Remember the shelter. He is our shelter. There is no other tent. You know, David said this: "Lord, I'd rather be a doorkeeper at your tent. I'd rather be, a, you know, I'd rather be a doorkeeper." Your house, then, to dwell in the tent of wickedness. He knows, or the tent of the wicked. He knows the truth of the feast, and its continuous fulfillment. The feast has started the day the Son of God came, and tabernacled among us. Second, church, the Lord pitches His tent in our personal and collective pilgrimage. In your personal walk, each and every one of us. He pitches a tent with you and I, and as a group of people, he does the same. And let us recognize that we are people of the journey. We are people of the journey here in Gateway, especially. We are people of the journey. We invite people to come into the journey because we know that the Lord is tabernacled among us. Why do we stand if you can and we sing this song as a prayer unto the Lord? Those at home, if you may, please follow on. This is our prayer, Lord. Let there be a canopy stretch forth to Thy praise, a tent for the glory of God. Let's go. 
forth to thy praise a dance for the glory of God that thy grace may abide let thy glory reside in this place where we pause on That thy grace may abide. That thy grace may abide. Let thy glory reside in this place where we post on our way. Yes, Lord Jesus. this is our prayer this morning for each and every one of us Lord and collectively as a church Lord thank you Lord that you have built a tent among us in our personal and collective journey in this pilgrimage Lord I pray every day of the week ahead Lord we open our minds and our hearts to understand that you are tabernacled with us Lord Sometimes, like the disciples on the road to Himayas, Lord, we might not recognize you. But Lord, you will come along and you will say that I want to abide with you. So we give thanks to you, Lord. And Lord, we want to say this prayer one more time, Lord. Come and build your tent in our pilgrimage, Lord. It's so wonderful. In Jesus' most wonderful name, Father. Amen. Amen. God bless you, church. Have a great week ahead.